In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to load a simulation that was described in another video of this tutorial series. Uh, and we're going to then analyze that simulation to calculate distances between two amino acids. So the first thing I'm going to do is load the simulation. And in this case, we're looking at casein kinase that's solvated in a water box. So I'm going to load the protein structure file first. And then I'm going to load the simulation, which is CSN underscore water box underscore MD for molecular dynamics. I'm sorry, underscore WB for water box. And it's dot DCD. That's our <coughs> simulation file. And you'll notice this is a pretty big file. It's two gigabytes. Um, so what I'm going to do for the sake of time, because it can take a little bit of time to load these files, I'm only going to load from 0 to 2,500 frames. There are actually 10,000 frames in this simulation, um, but I'd like to speed up the tutorial. Um, so I'm only going to load the first 2,501 frames. And as it loads, you'll see that uh, frame by frame it loads, and you can see the, the shaking of the simulation. And over here in the main window, you can see it counting the number of frames as it loads. And while that loads, I just want to show you that my simulation is in this folder, casein kinase subfolder wild type, and here's the file we're loading. One directory above in casein kinase, I have a file called distance.tcl. That's the script that's going to do the calculation for us. Um, so I just need to keep in mind that I have that one directory up from where my simulation is. And I will put the contents of this script in the description of this tutorial video so that you can copy and save it into a file called distance.tcl. One thing you'll notice after this loads is that the water box can start to take on a funny shape here. It looks like there's something missing in this corner. That's because of the boundary conditions that we put in. Uh, in the beginning of this simulation. It's actually not a problem, but I'm going to include a link to the uh, mailing list for NAMD where you can see a discussion about this. Um, and you can fix this if you want to create nice uh, images to save for a publication or a presentation, for example. Um, but just know that it's not a problem. It's an artifact of the boundary conditions of the simulation. So the next thing I need to do is call the script into VMD so that we can do the calculations. So uh, what I do is I type in source. That just means take in any of the procedures that are available in this distance.tcl. And again, because it's one directory up from where I am currently, you can see here that I've change directories into my wild type directory. So I need to go up one directory into casein kinase. So I put dot dot slash to go up one directory to find this script file. Hit enter and now the procedures that are in that file are available and the only procedure in the file is one called distance. So if I type distance now it turns green because BMD knows that that's a procedure. And there are some variables that the procedure needs. We need to tell it two residues that we want to calculate a distance between. So I'm going to put in res ID 179 and 243. For this particular casein kinase, residue 179 is a serine that we believe uh, becomes phosphorylated. And when it does, uh, the charge of that phosphorylated serine can then interact with the charge of an arginine that's at residue 243. So we want to know the distance between those um, because we believe that might be an important parameter um, for the structure of this particular enzyme. The next thing I need to do is give it a number of bins because what this procedure will do is calculate a histogram of the distances between these residues. And the way that it does the calculation is it calculates a center of mass for each residue. So it will take the position and the mass of each atom in the residue and it will calculate a center of mass. And then it calculates the three-dimensional distance between those centers of mass. And then it will calculate a histogram of 
the frequency that a particular distance is observed. And so I'm going to give it a number of bins for that histogram. Because I only have 2,500 frames here, I'm going to put in about 1%, 25 bins for the histogram. Uh, if you load in the entire simulation that has 10,000 frames, you might put in 50 or 100 bins. Um, but that's something you can look at the output and determine if you need more or less bins for, uh, to get a good statistical number versus a higher resolution in your histogram. And you can also compute the histogram in Excel if you'd like, because this is also going to save a file that has the distances between the amino acids um, for each simulation step. The next thing I need to put is the name of two output files, one that's going to store the distance between the amino acids and one that's going to store the histogram of those distances. And it's going to save them as comma separated values, so I'm putting in .csv. Those are easily loaded into just about any analysis software. Uh, I'll use Excel just for showing you what these files look like. If I hit enter, we'll see that it goes frame by frame to calculate those distances. And it's going to save it in whatever directory you're currently in. So I'm in this wild type directory. And we'll notice that we now have these two files, distance and histogram. So if I open distance, we'll see that there are two columns here. The first column is just the step in the simulation. So if I scroll to the bottom, it should go to 2,500, starting at 0. So there's 2,501. And the second column is the distance in angstrom between the centers of mass of the uh, two amino acids. So if I insert a graph here, we could, in principle, we could scale the step to the number of femtoseconds that each time step corresponded to. So you'd get a distance versus time. I'm just going to leave it as the iteration step and calculate a, uh, and just graph the distance versus the iteration step. Uh, one thing to notice is that with Excel, it auto scales. And so it will look like there are very large changes, but it's really just that the scale of this graph is not terribly uh, zoomed out. And so, for example, if we went out a little further, um, you can see that this is really just uh, a distance that's going around 30 angstrom throughout the simulation. Not a huge change going on. The next thing I'll do is I'll open the histogram file and in this case what we have is these are the distance bins and this is the frequency that each of those distances were observed. So if I highlight the two columns and create a column graph, maybe not a column graph, let's try just a scatter. What we see is that there are predominantly two distances here that show up in the histogram, one that's closer to about 28 and a half angstrom and one that's close to about 30 and a half angstrom. And if we go back to the distance data, you can actually see that for a long time in the simulation it stays just above 30 and then about halfway through here it's shifting down below 30, which corresponds to these two peaks in the distribution of distances. Uh, it could be that we would see one of these become larger or smaller if we had loaded the entire uh, simulation, but we only loaded a quarter of it, so it, it's hard to say if this is consistent with the entire simulation. Um, so just keep that in mind, that this, this may, this dip here, with longer simulation or if we had loaded the entire thing that may go away and this may, may become one broad distribution. 
So that is how to load the data from your simulation into something like Excel and get an idea of the conformational changes that are going on in this particular enzyme. Uh, if we had also simulated, this is, this is the result for the wild type, if we had also simulated the phosphorylated serine uh, and graphed it like this, we might see that uh, the two histograms have differences that correspond to the function, uh, the functional effects of those charge interactions when phosphorylated. So that's just one way to simulate a protein uh, with a mutation and without or with some sort of post-translational modification and also without a post-translational modification and see if it has an effect on the structure which presumably then is related to the function of this enzyme.